got Eddie Schwartz, who's with Nationwide, the Vice President and Chief Information Security Officer for Nationwide Insurance. I'd sing their theme song, but uh, I'm not in a shower, and I don't think anybody wants to hear me. Uh, they don't. It would be nice. Eddie they could do really a little don't. dance. and uh, They really don't. You never know. Okay, we've uh, combined the talks because they've taken a look at their talks and felt it should be combined. So this will be like a part one and a part two talk. Thank you. Great. Hi, I'm Eddie Schwartz, and this is my partner, Diana. <laughs> uh, what we decided to do, we, we got together and figured out that our talks had some overlap, and uh, what we decided to do is focus in this session initially on the business drivers associated with privacy, that being the consumer issues, regulatory pressures, things like the FTC, recent Treasury Department regulation, things like that, healthcare regulation, and talk about the actual impacts that impose risk and risk which we as security officers officers are uh, tasked to deal with. The second part of the presentation is where we're going to focus more on the, uh, the actual risk mitigation. What's the work plan to get through all this privacy stuff? What's an approach that you can take back uh, and apply just about anywhere in the organization, whether you're going to apply it you know, as, as a CIO to your IT organization, you're going to try to convince management to get on board with an actual methodology they can follow in some way, or that you just want to know as a security person, what the heck should I be doing to get this under control? So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Diana to get it started. Thanks. Yeah, it was interesting. We, we just met each other last week, and, and the way we met was that Eddie was going over the Black Hat site and said, hey. We're doing almost the same talk. And I said, nah, but we were. Um, so it, it was, it's actually a good fit. And I do apologize to anybody who, who read the, the schedule. And, and I hope nobody comes into the next missing out on some of these good background things. But it's a very good fit because I come from a consulting and services background. So I was actually going into companies, helping them look at their privacy issues and building a framework and, and getting this through the organization. And Eddie's coming up from inside the organization and seeing how it plays out. So Actually having to do it. and deal with it and deal so with all the complications of it. You've got two good sides of the, the house. Again, this is really, we're focusing on policy to technology. I am going to cover the policies. I will be going on the background of HIPAA and GLBA, but um, which is, you'll hear about what they are during the, the talk. Um, we are not lawyers, and that is one thing to keep in mind. Privacy is a very legal kind of thing. We, we aren't lawyers. We don't play them on TV. So um, just as a background, if, if there are some big legal questions, issues that get raised, we wouldn't be able to answer them. We're technologists. So um, we are talking about privacy, and I think it's, it's a pretty important if you, if you go back and you think about healthcare and if you even dive into the Hippocratic Oath, you can see, you know, whatever I see or hear which ought not to be spoken of abroad, I will not divulge, which is the basis of privacy and privacy has been very important since 400 BC to healthcare. Um, Again, here's just the agenda. We are going to talk a little bit about what privacy is. Uh, people have very different ideas about privacy and very different definitions. So we'll cover that briefly. Um, we will talk about the regulations and some backgrounds and then some impacts, basically the why you should care. And then in the next, after the break, we'll be coming back and going into the actual how you get to the implementation point. And do you have to read your disclaimer? This is actually a, a nationwide disclaimer. So. Well, the disclaimer is that what we're going to present in the second part is an actual how to do it guide that anybody can follow to get this area under control. I've been fortunate enough to be involved in this space for a couple of years and actually have developed a methodology. However, uh, the disclaimer is that that methodology represents in no way opinions of our, my company and it does not provide any recommendations or even potentially indicate any practices that we may or may not follow. And there were some other legal things that I took out, but you understand the disclaimer. so. Okay. Uh, thanks. All right. <laughs> so you got that? Okay. Um, Nicholas Negroponte said, everything on the web is ultimately about trust, which is not quite privacy, but um, this is about trust, and privacy is about 
in a large way about trust. If you go back, back the last hundred years, even more than the, the 400, the, the 400 BC that we had there from uh, Hippocrates, it, it, privacy is not new, invasions of your privacy, it's not new. It, it happened before. It's going to happen again. Um, people, you know, the paparazzi's always been out there. There have been gossip, tabloids, yellow journalism. People have gone into the into privacy realm before. The difference now is that that there's no time and distance. It's it's not physically separated anymore. Somebody can get to you digitally from all over the world at any time of day or night and exploit that data and persist that data and aggregate and reuse that data. So it has shifted slightly. Although privacy invasions definitely not new. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. You just hop well, in. Well, I'll just add one thing. We've never you talked together. You mentioned the, the quote about the trust. When I started at Nationwide, uh, I met with the CEO like the first week I was there, and he really didn't know what you know a chief security officer would do or why they were even hiring me exactly. But he, what he did say to me is he said, you know, the most important thing to me is our brand image and the trust that people put in that brand. And he said he was really concerned about the internet and how that might erode the perception of customers that they should trust us in some way. And that was good because I had privacy on my mind when I went to talk to him. So I, I think, you know, even though trust and privacy are different things, he kind of equated the two. And it made a lot of sense to me in terms of how he sees what's important to the business, you know. And Scott McNeely obviously has a good bottom line there. You have zero privacy, so just get over it. Um, I basically think of, of privacy as, as the, the information gravy train out there with, with marketers and with other companies. I mean, they're, they're, not, they're not going out to, to invade your privacy. They don't want to invade your privacy because they're malicious. They're looking at it as a way to cross-sell, upsell. It's the information gravy train. That's what they're looking at and getting the, the information on there. Again, distance is irrelevant. Um, uh, th this whole big brother fear within consumers has really led to a firestorm of privacy concern among people. They're worried about the government stepping in. They're worried about companies stepping in. Um, there have been some really interesting things going on in Michigan. Jennifer Granholm, the district attorney, in, in, uh, the attorney general, sorry, in Michigan, a couple months ago, stopped a merger between two companies. I'm not sure if you're aware of um, Abacus and DoubleClick. Is anybody familiar with them? Do DoubleClick does a clickstream tracking on the web, you're going, yeah, I know them. Yeah, yeah. Well, do you know what Abacus is? Okay. Ha. <laughs> Okay, Abacus is is a uh, the company that have you ever had? A lot of times they'll ask you what's your what's your zip code out there at a retailer, or have you ever purchased anything? You get one catalog in the mail from Smith and Hawken or Pottery Barn, and you buy and you know then maybe a year later you get another catalog. But finally one day you buy something from that catalog, and all of a sudden, whoosh, you get catalogs from all these different vendors. That's because a company called Abacus was aggregating your data and sending you out uh, new bits of information. Well, so Abacus was tracking people in the real world at stores and through, through catalogs. DoubleClick was tracking what people were doing over the internet. DoubleClick bought Abacus a few months ago, and they wanted to get together and, and aggregate that data so that they could learn about what you were doing on the web and what you were doing on the land. And the Attorney General of Michigan, Jennifer Graham, stepped in and said, yeah, I don't think so, guys. Let's stop this for a little while. Um, because there is a firestorm. There is a big concern with folks about getting that The other, The other issue recently, uh, if you've seen a, a lot of these dot-coms are going bankrupt, I guess the stock price dropped through the floor, one of the things you may have seen is Toy Smart, and basically they had a, uh, a customer database, you know, including information on the ages of children and, and so on, and basically they wanted to go and sell that database as part of their bankruptcy procedures. Uh, the FTC stepped in and, and obviously stopped them from doing that, but we're going to see more and more issues where Toy Smart may have had a privacy policy posted on their website something happens and, and un unfortunately bankruptcy law would allow them potentially to do this. Uh, this is very bad obviously and I'm sure you as consumers wouldn't find that very appealing if you had agreed to do business with them under certain terms and then they go and breach those terms later on for other reasons and you don't have a say in it basically. Um, again, privacy is something that, that people have very different definitions for. Um, they're slippery definitions. They're shifting around. Privacy itself has gotten very, very political in the past uh, you know, few months. Marketing has one idea of it. Technical folks tend to think of privacy as, hey, doesn't that mean it's encrypted over the wire? Isn't that privacy? But now, you know, the, that's uh, um, 
personal people, you know, personally you have an idea of what's your privacy as somebody looking in your window, that kind of thing. So I, I put up here the American Society for Testing and Materials, and they, they do definitions, they're a definition company, group, and uh, they, they have privacy as the right of the individual to be left alone, confidentiality is the responsibility for limiting the disclosure of private matters, and security is the means to control access and protect. You can take those definitions or not if they have value for you. A lot of people who are working with privacy right now do, though, refer to the ASTM definitions, which is why I'm, I'm sharing them with you now. We're going to go into... I was just going to say an important sub-point for security people on this is that, you know, uh, you know why, why do security people care about privacy? Well, because we are a, a significant enabler for the success of a privacy program. Uh, you know, in terms of these definitions, I mean, that's one of the things you want to take home to your, you know, whoever you work for is that uh, you can't do privacy if you don't have this enabler in place. Yeah, I, you know, I sort of laugh. A lot of people, when I was at, at, at the Big Five Consulting Firm, a lot of people would say, so, what, what What's the privacy killer app? You know, what's the tool? What's the privacy tool? You know, P3P? Is that going to be it? Is that going to solve all the problems? No. Uh, there's no silver bullet for privacy. And really, if, you, if you're very familiar with security, you can see that the ways that privacy ultimately will be implemented technically are a lot of the tools that we have been using as security professionals for years and years and years. Um, there's not a lot of brand new bells and whistles. A lot of the stuff that's coming through is legally related, policy related. But when it gets down to how are you protecting data on a, on a machine, you know, it's encryption. We know that. How are we striating responsibility and keeping data separate on a, on a machine. We've been doing that with trusted operating systems. This isn't, there's not, there's not a big privacy solution. One privacy software, you know, buy it off the, the shelf and you're private. Uh, you want to do your lexicon? Sure. Uh, part of uh, what you need to understand in terms of being able to deal with this space is that there are certain core principles that are pretty much pervasive across all of the privacy regulation and uh, different code that's been written. The Europeans certainly are, are providing leadership in this space because they have very stringent privacy laws in place, but we're starting to see in the U.S. now a lot of federal and state regulation. Most of it centers around these four concepts here. The first concept is notice and awareness. That is, you need to tell the customer what you're doing with, with their data in some way. And what that means is you actually have to send them a notice or in some way contact them and say, this is what we do with your data. Even if it's, we don't share it with anyone, you need to do that. And then you need to make sure that you're not lying about it too. Right, we cover that and that's part of GLBA is very specific about that. So we'll right. cover that a little bit later. Um, the issue of choice and consent, okay. Given, the, however you use the information, the consumer should have the right to opt out of the use of that information in the way that you've stipulated if they don't want to. So there has to be a mechanism in place where you can say, I don't want you sharing this with anybody else. Please let me, please, please stop. You have a question about this? The, the, uh, the question is, is the U.S. going to go opt-in or opt-out? Because uh, uh, the answer, in my opinion, is that it's going to be opt-in. I mean, that's the world we're heading towards, most definitely. And, and that's a very key question because... You, you think opt-in? I think op You don't think opt-out? I think it's going to be opt-out. Oh, I think it's going to be opt-in. Really? Okay. Yeah. I, the reason... Point, well, counterpoint. We, we'll talk about this in the second section, but just to di digress for, for a minute, it's, it's a lot harder to, um, let's say that you say basically, uh, basically everybody, uh, we're not going to use your information in any way unless you say it's okay for us to do it. It's a lot easier to manage that because it's a smaller percentage of people. I think if, if you basically say we're going to share this with everybody and then you know potentially 35 percent of the population come back and say no I don't want you to do that you've got to manage that those preferences in every single system you have it, it depends how how you're all organized but I mean let's take an insurance company for example a customer service rep at an insurance company will open nine applications sometimes to service a set of policies 
do we have data attributes across all of those applications that w in which we can flag those privacy preferences today and have those preferences pervasively be carried across all those databases and systems? Duh. The answer is no, we don't. So, you know, the world, the world that we want to live in is one in which it's, it's very simple. You know. Actually, that's why I think it's going to be opt out because the, the bottom line with opt out is that I will share your data. That's it. And you have the, you have the option to opt out, but I'm just, I'm going to be sharing your data. So if you don't check, so the, the retailers or the companies that want to do the, the info gravy train are going to bet that a lot of people aren't going to even bother checking that opt out box. And then if they do check it, okay, well now I won't be able to use your data, but it's a path of least resistance. It's setting them up to have the data. So that's why I'm going to, I'm going to vote for. I vote opt in. Okay. I vote opt out. Right, you're from now, <laughs> Okay, uh, the third issue is security integrity. And, and this is a key point for all of us here. What things are we doing to make sure that the data uh, on an individual is accurate in nature and that there are security controls surrounding that data? Processes, mechanisms of some sort, policies, etc. And it, you know, a, a lot of regulation is very vague on this today. We're now getting real regulatory guidance on what constitutes due care in this, and we'll talk about that more later. And finally, enforcement and redress. What do I do if I feel you're not playing with me the right way? You're not being square with me. You're not notifying me. You're not doing what I ask you to do with my data. What recourse do I have? Uh, you know, how, how is that whole thing handled? Going. <laughs> sure, well, yeah. Okay, personal identifiable information, that's what we're talking about here. It's, it's something that, that identifies you uniquely in some way, some combination of your personal attributes. Okay, if it were just, let's say, your last name and your age, it might be a little harder to track you than if it was your full name and address, let's say. That would be personally identifiable information. Or your social security number and you know some other attribute. There are ways to link these things together. You also might see it listed as III, individually identifiable information. And sometimes it's referred to in, in, in privacy it's that way. Three potential choices and what companies would do. Opt out is basically the company has said, I'm sharing your data. If you you want me to stop doing it call me and let me know and and you know we'll take you out of that opt-in is basically we've got all these cool business partners that we want to share your data with but we're not going to do it unless you say you want to participate in that in some way so you're opting into the use of that data do not share is we don't share your data period and uh, that's a position that we've actually taken in nationwide which is we do not share so that's good. So now you know. If you're privacy aware, you might want to go to Nationwide. Um, I, I put in a couple of slides here to just explain to people how things are, are profiled. Sometimes people don't understand how their privacy or their, their information is used. A lot of times people feel like, well, what the different, they don't understand how a company could actually use it. So they think that it's all right if they give away their information. They, they, they say, yeah, you know, I'll definitely, that's fine. You can follow my click streams and you can see what I'm searching for on the web and you can and see that. But, it, and, and just give me a, a PC for 55 cents a day. And then maybe later on that information is used in a way that they don't feel comfortable with and they go, oh, you know, this isn't okay. A good example of, of, of uh, something that happened a couple of years ago with, well, I guess a year and a half ago now was CVS pharmacy. Uh, it's a pharmacy that's known more on the East Coast. But what they were doing was they were selling the information of their patients' uh, prescription lists to marketers, direct mail marketers. So say you, you got a, say, say you, were, you, you had a, a prescription to Accutane and to Retin-A. Well, you know, the, the folks that, that sell benzoyl peroxide, which is, an, those are both acne, prescribed for acne. Um, you know, the acne medication people were like, great. So they're sending out coupons for benzoyl peroxide, but people were all of a sudden looking at this, or, or you know, things about, you know, Benacal is coming out. It's going to be good for your heart. It's the guy who's taking the heart medicine. And how did I, how did they find this out? Well, the, the consumers got pretty upset because they did not like the idea of, of some direct marketer knowing what drugs they were taking, which is pretty understandable. No legislation was enacted, um, the public outcry was so loud and furious that CVS um, opted to cease and desist by themselves. But it, it's an example of you know what can go on. A GLBA itself was brought up um, in some ways uh, because it, it's 
when, in 1929, they separated all the financial services and the insurance and the brokerage houses because of the, the crash. And now everybody gets to converge again. Citigroup was one of the first big conglomerates here in the US. But it raised a lot of issues around, well, wait a second, if, I, if my insurance company knows that I have a heart condition or I have high cholesterol and I'm going to get a mortgage from that same company, could I be rejected for the mortgage based on my health? If they have the data, it's possible. It is possible. So how did they do all this magic and aggregate? There are a couple different ways that, that you can um, profile. Um, one is behavioral data. So you profile how somebody acts in a given situation. That may sound a little strange digitally, but um, an example that you all have, have probably experienced is your credit card. Your credit card does heuristics and, and profiling of how you spend on that card. And when they find something that's very anomalous, they will call you up or they will potentially stop the card. So if you, if you tend to spend, in a, I had my card stolen a couple, a couple of years ago, and I didn't know, and I got a call from my credit card company, and they said, are you in Rhode Island right now? And I, I was at my home in Boston, you know, picked up the phone. Are you in Rhode Island right now charging $1,000 worth of running shoes? And I said, no. <laughs> I said, okay. So they canceled out the card, but they knew that I didn't go and, and charge in that particular way. It wasn't even in the amount, because I have charged more, higher amounts. It was the profile of my behavioral data. So you can digitally learn how somebody acts. A lot of intrusion detection right now, some of it is looking at, at how people act and learning around that. Um, also, buying preferences are another thing that you can track. You know, Amazon does it to you. They, they learn what kind of books you like, and then lo and behold, the next time you go, if there's a book along the, the kind of thing that you're interested in, there it is. In some ways, this is very positive, right? We want our credit card companies to, to stop misuse on our credit cards. That's a good thing. And maybe you like that Amazon is telling you when something new is coming out. I mean, I had an interesting case where one of the bands I like a lot, one of the members was in another band, and I hadn't known about it, and Amazon knew to tell me. And that was great. But it can also be kind of spooky if you turn around and see how it could be used against you. Yeah, like their community profiles. You know, if you go on there and you look at some book, and it says, you know, this is the number two book at HP this week, or something like that. I mean, I don't know about you, but as a corporate security officer, it bugs me that some company that I didn't authorize is advertising that you know our, all of our employees bought the latest Daniel Steele book or something like that <laughs> you know because first of all if they're associated with the company when they bought it they must have bought it on company time or or they somehow tracked it from our you know an IP address or who knows how they they did it you know that, that kind of stuff bugs me and I, you know I, I would definitely want to somehow block that you know so um, aggregated data is when they start gathering your data and, and slicing and dicing it to find new and interesting things about you. The Abacus and, and Clickstream example was an example of, of, of aggregated data. You can be um, very active about it. You can opt to release that information on the on digitally. Um, it can also be pretty passive. Clickstream tracking is one of those. Uh, a lot of people don't realize how, how tracked they are out on the, the web. And I think that you said there was an example in this book of, but you know, I, I have written a couple papers on this, and, and I do walk through an example, and I think that there's, there might be something similar in here, where somebody just goes on the web and starts to track something, let's say they, they're depressed. So they start off at, a, at an herbal site and read about St. John's warts, and, and then they go and read something at a, at a psychological site about depression, and then maybe they go to the drugstore, and they're out of razor blades, but they buy razor blades. Um, could somebody link all those together? Yeah, conceivably. I mean, that the information can certainly be aggregated. Could somebody make a choice on that um, and make a decision to, to come over to your house and ask about your state of health? Yes, you had a question. It, it, the clickstream tracking is not really right now much of a, an, an opt out. People are clickstream tracked without sometimes any ability to opt out of it. Um, opt in, opt out. Generally, though, is is 
going to adhere to whatever policy is posted by that company. So third party sharing um, is, is very often something that's described in, in certainly financial services, health insurance, that sort of thing. But you don't, you'd have to read whatever company's opt-in, opt-out policy you're, you're adhering to when you... And, and try to understand it. Have. Because in our case, I mean, we have uh, an insurance business, many insurance businesses. We have healthcare businesses. We have a business that aggregates disability information from many companies and provides profiling patterns of that aggregate information, including our internal employees. Okay, uh, we have financial services, we have 401k annuities and so on. Okay, so who is, in between companies, how are they allowed to share? Under certain regulations, they're allowed to share certain things, like financial information uh, under GLB, as long as they're not non-affiliated third parties. Okay, but the healthcare information is not allowed to be shared is, is in terms of PII when it's two different companies we own. So it's, it's a really complex matrix that you have to deal with. And again, just take it down to the systems level for a second and try to imagine the rules engine to manage where data goes based on all these different rules. Even if you've said, I do not share, in our case, it's we do not share with third parties. Internally, we share a lot. <laughs> right. The, the, the problem with that is is you just turning off the click stream. I mean, we talk later about Cookie Pal, for example, or something like that. I mean, you can do that, but I've actually encountered websites that won't do business with you if you don't accept cookies. You yeah. know. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's, there's, there are anonymizers out there now. Zero Knowledge is a good example, and I, I wonder how how much take they're going to get in the market because of, of issues like that. Um, yes. I meant like a drugstore.com site. So, and yes, the click streams, I mean, the way DoubleClick works is that you have a deal with DoubleClick and they're depositing cookies on your site. The problem, is, on your hard drive, the problem is that the user may not know that the cookie's getting deposited or that these three different sites have a deal with DoubleClick. Right, and what Diana mentioned earlier too is, is again, the, the potential aggregation through an abacus and a doubleclick.net, for example. You know, abacus, for example, has what you buy at the grocery store. Okay, now they're going to aggregate that against everything you've done online, and they have a pretty significant amount of data on that. That's kind of scary. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Well, here's yes. another. I mean, does it, t tell me if this aggravates you. People are selling your names all the time. Where's your commission on that? You know, I mean, I want some of that cash. I I, I was reading some stats somewhere on what some of these mailing lists are worth and stuff. And it, like in the case of Toy Smart, Toy Smart was yeah, yeah was, a great example. Yeah, it was like 15 million dollars or something like that. You know, I'm thinking, well, how many customers do I have and what's my cut? You know, I mean, maybe if they said to you, we'll share your data, okay, but we'll give you a commission every time we share it. Well, if I you think know. about it, some people are doing that though, right? Because the sites that say, hey, free internet access, just let us track your click stream everywhere you go. Um, you know, then it's like, okay, you, you, there you, you've bartered out your, your habits for the I think the, the gentleman stream. in the back had a question. I'm sorry, yes. Yeah, uh, Good question. Um, I think, you know, when it comes to personally identifiable information, there's an assumption that if you're providing what is defined as personally identifiable information, you are that person. Because essentially you've given an identity out. But yeah, I mean, there, there still are issues of identity theft associated with that. And then there's, of course, the issue of non-repudiation. And I, I think that's always going to be an issue you know, more than just privacy preferences, 
non-repudiation on the web is going to be an issue for a while. I mean, they can tie you to your credit card number and you tell them other things about you, and there's probably a reasonable assumption that it's you based on all these things. But, you know, is it truly non-repudiable? No. Yeah. So, um, is it okay if we hold some of the questions? Okay. Um, I don't mean to... We love questions, but we're just going to yeah, keep, keep moving. Okay, why worry? Well, obviously you're worried as people right now hearing about this, and that's not really a, you know, that, that's an easy one, right? You personally as a consumer are like, hmm. okay, but why worry as, as a person in, a, in the corporate world? And if you're not in financial services or in healthcare, you may be going, hey, I'm out of here. You know, HIPAA and GLBA aren't going to apply to me because those are just, in, in those industries, no, that's, you're, you're, no one is safe. You're not safe out there. If you're doing security, security is going to be wrapped up in, in implementing privacy. These acts are far reaching. They're stretching beyond just healthcare and financial services already. Um, they're harbingers of society's desire. I mean, this is coming. You know, who knows who's next on the hit list, but it's not just going to be financial services and healthcare that are going to be regulated in this manner. Um, so it's a good thing to know. Well, if you have a website, you're subject to FTC scrutiny. Already, yep. yeah. So. Um, the other reason to be concerned is that lawyers are starting to notice. And when the lawyers get involved, lawsuits occur, and that can be extremely expensive. I thought it was pretty interesting that the Association of Attorneys General, when they met on June 20th in Seattle, they had all their public sessions were based on, which is interesting, public-private, but anyway, they were all around privacy and litigation for privacy. So. Um, that's, I, I'd be concerned if I was an organization, a company that had any data stored at all about people. Um, why else should you worry? Well, consumers are worried. The numbers are pretty clear. We've got a, a lot of numbers up here that prove that the consumers and customers, they care about this. They, they, they don't want their information shared out. Do you no, just, these are stats that we developed in, in, in forming our privacy position. And you know, it's re, is respect to healthcare, uh, uh, property and casualty business, life insurance, and so on. And you could see that basically they trust us, okay, but they also place a high value on that information. So again, we've got to continue to keep the bar high on doing things that keep consumers from worrying about what the heck Nationwide, for example, or any company is doing with their data. Yeah, and, and also um, something about uh, as e-business expands and people have partners, your partner may be um, under some of these regulations, so you may have to, to adhere to the regulations. Or uh, even something like EU, the data directive, there's a data directive in, in the European Union, and any company that's doing business with the EU does need to adhere to those regulations. So uh, just not being in, in financial services and healthcare is, is not a... And, and those are opt-in, by the way. Yes, those, it is often, but the Europeans are, they, the Europeans have a really interesting history that the Americans don't, and I think that's why the Europeans have a stronger privacy policy for it, because there was a time in Europe where records that were kept about your religious, uh, I don't know, what, your religion, what, what religion you believed in, were ways to find you and hunt you down and kill you. And that has not happened here in the U.S. And the, the Europeans are much more aware of, of privacy. And I think it's because they have a very recent tangible history that, of you know, how, how information about you personally can be abused. You want to talk about that? Sure. Uh, again, these are parts of surveys that we've conducted that are part of IBM Harris surveys that are on the uh, Privacy in American Business website. It's a link in the back of uh, one of the two presentations. What are consumers like? The convenience of the internet, right? The speed uh, to, to which they can get stuff and, and see stuff that they want. They also like personalization, but they like anonymity. And those are kind of at, at odds with each other to a certain extent. You know, I want a personalized experience. Don't put cookies on my hard drive. Well, it's tough, you know. Um, they want control over their personal data. You know, I want to be able to tell you what to do. They want uh, explicit and clear privacy terms and conditions. Tell me what you're doing in simple English, not lawyerish, lawyer ease. You know, um, they want to know that you're doing something. You know, for example, if it's a financial services website, they want to hear the security language in there that says we use SSL 128-bit encryption, blah blah blah. You know, even though we have no security policies and we <laughs> we have no security officer and our budget keeps getting cut, we're taking care of this. You know, that kind of thing. And um, 
you know, they, they want to see various mechanisms mentioned in some way. And I can't remember what I meant by data differentiation. I, I have your note actually in front of me, and what you meant was, um, and it's a good point, some, uh, some bits of data are more sensitive to people than others. Yes. Um, for example, some people, you know, your height or your weight may be very, very sensitive data that you don't want to share. Social security numbers have recently come up as a real hot button for things that people don't want. So on the other hand, your name may be something that you're more than happy to ch share with everybody, or the fact that, you know, you like coon cats or something. So it really depends a lot on a, you know, what, what, how, how much you value that data and its importance. What don't they like? Oh, you want me to do this? One? Yeah. Um, okay, what don't they like? You sure this is mine? I think this is yours. Okay, well, anything <laughs> they can't get, right? That's what people, people hate that. If they don't understand it, they don't like it. So if you're, if you're making things difficult or the, like even, you know, this opt-out thing, I don't know if it's inside the company, outside the company, you know, don't confuse people. They're not going to be happy with it. Um, people really don't like things that get shared with third parties at all. Um, you know, if it's, it's again, it's the same point that we heard earlier. Hey, if I'm trusting you as a business, I trusted you. That's okay. Whatever your policies are, I'm going to abide by, but you know, don't go sharing it with that other third party. Same as CVS. CVS, you can have my, my uh, pharmaceutical, my information, but don't go sharing it with a, a telemarketer. Um, people don't like things that they didn't ask for most of the time. That's why push technology failed. Now, um, it's, it's just, if, if you didn't ask for it, you tend not to want it, so don't send people junk mail automatically based on preferences. Don't send them the direct marketing stuff. They're not going to like it. Uh, what, do, what do consumers tend to worry about? These are the, the, the top three things. Who's seeing my data? What are they going to do with it? And when they find out it's wrong, they get very, very upset. So you want to be careful to protect those for the, the consumers in your company. Um, and you know what's interesting is that the use and disclosure cover both authorized and unauthorized use of the data. So consumers are, you know, not only concerned about what's allowed, but also what could be misused. Uh, the corporations themselves, what are, what are you guys probably worried about? You're worried about the acts, the acts themselves and how they're going to be regulated. Um, the acts are federal. Um, there are state regulations too. The acts tend to be known as something called floors. So that's really a basis that you can adhere to, but the state acts tend to, to raise the, the bar a little bit. Um, the international standards um, and data privacy standards are also big concerns. Across the U.S. right now there are 400 different pieces of privacy legislation under consideration, both at the state and federal level. So you can imagine the patchwork that you might wind up with. If you're a, a business that uh, you know, does uh, business all over the country, you, you might have a problem on your hands if, if some, a couple of states decide to raise the bar, let's say to opt in, you know, where everything else is opt out. I mean, that would be a real drag. And there are states that have those kinds of laws under consideration. So far, they haven't gone anywhere, though. Right. Um, yeah, you, you, basically privacy is going to be something that you need to, to implement in order to be a successful e-business. Uh, customers are saying that they absolutely demand it. You can see a study up here from IBM. And also the FTC is, is starting to crack down very seriously on people adhering to their privacy policies. I'll give you one case study on that. Um, GeoCities, anyone heard what happened to them? And basically they, they published a privacy policy that said, you know, they do X with the data, they turned around and completely violated that policy. The FTC came after them, found that they were indeed, uh, you know, violating uh, the, uh, the use of information, you know, the, the, the appropriate uses of information, and put them under a consent decree. What that means is that whenever uh, GeoCities wants to use their customer database, they have to get permission from the FTC before they can do it. Not a, not a good place to be if you're if, if you're a company in, in, in the dot-com world, so. You want to talk about the Bancor? U.S. Bancor? The oversharing? They overshared. Yeah, I, I mean, again, basically the, the issue is that, uh, it's funny, I, I, I'm on a steering committee for a privacy conference towards the end of the year, and all the people want to talk about in a steering committee are online privacy, online privacy. It's like, that's the only thing. I mean, I don't know where you guys keep your data, but in Nationwide, it's on mainframes. I mean, it's a back office processes. It's on big sun boxes, on Oracle tables, you know, and that stuff's not out on the internet. I mean, the internet doesn't even see half of that stuff. 
So the issue is that you can have a situation where there's conflicting, uh, conflict, conflicting objectives between online and offline policy. And you can say online, well, we're protecting your data. We're offline, you completely violate it out the back door. Can't do that. I mean, basically what you put on your website has to hold through from end to end in your company. And that's, that was a point we faced at first that was difficult. We uh, went live uh, with a uh, site to sell insurance over the web in uh, March, I think it was. And the people that were doing the website, they were like, okay, where's our privacy policy? They wrote this thing, the lawyers looked at it, it was really cool. And then I said, Tell, prove to me that this is what we're really doing with this information. Well, that's not my problem, they said. You know, on the website, we don't, do, we don't share it. Well, it goes into the same databases that the agents are, are operating against in their offices. You know, so I mean, we had inconsistencies there that needed to be reconciled. And a lot of people in in both the business and IT side don't understand that linkage. Anyway, people have gotten in trouble for stuff like that, and uh, you'll continue to see that. Let me address this one too. Yeah. Um, have any of you seen these uh, aggregators where basically they'll take, let's say, an account at Chase and an account at Citibank and a, an account at Nationwide or Schwab? They'll aggregate all that data onto a single site for you. Basically, you disclose your user IDs and passwords to them, and they conduct screen scraping and basically aggregate all your financial data from different institutions. Well, here's the problem: Are they a bank? No. S screen scraping is, is they were going to the, the website and they were grabbing the data off of the site. That's known as screen scraping. It's usually uh, applied to uh, kicks on a mainframe, right. getting data off behind so, a kicks region. So how do you, you know, who regulates that? Well, the, you know, the, for example, the OCC and, and the, the financial, you know, the treasury type of things, FDIC and the Fed, they have no jurisdiction over these organizations. And the banks can't stop these people from doing it if the customer has given their user ID and password over. So what happens? So a lot of banks have actually published on their website notices right up there in your face that say, do not work with aggregators because of all these bad things. And now the aggregators are annoyed about it and I think there's some lawsuits going back and forth. Uh, you know, First Union is, is, a, is a case in point. We're going to see more and more issues about that. I mean, there's something called the Financial Services Roundtable and they've actually had a forum recently on aggregators and how the heck should banks and other financial institutions deal with this, this threat to, well, probably their businesses in some respects, but I mean, customer privacy is what they're really concerned about because what if the customer perceives that the bank is the one that's given away the information, even though they're the ones that gave away the user ID and password. Yeah, well, I think it is very interesting. It, be it begs the essential bottom line privacy question, which is who owns the data? And if my data about my bank account is sitting at, at, at Fidelity or at Fleet Boston, but I want to give it to an aggregator, what right does Fleet have to not let me do that? But Fleet, because I see it as my data, I own it. But Fleet sees it as that they own it and they're providing a service to me. So it's a, it's, a, it's going to be an interesting question. You know, who, we don't know who. Oh, okay, yes. That's a, yeah, that's a great point. He's bringing up, what if your policy is you allow your own customers to opt out so they don't get the mailing, but then your direct marketing department in your same company buys a list and that customer happens to be on the list and now you direct mail to them and, and how, you, how you handle that. Just a little bit. Um, I'll just address it briefly. If it's a financial institution selling you the list, they can't do it anymore under GLB. I mean, that's a no-no, okay? Because it can't exchange that with non-affiliated third parties, okay? Right. 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 The issue, the issue would be, it would really boil down to, again, is there a regulatory environment that somehow governs that 
issue. In our case, for example, at Nationwide, we would not be able to do that and we would not be able to treat those separately because under GLB, insurance companies are required to call any personally identifiable information that we obtain, it now is a customer record, even if they don't own a product of ours. Right. Yeah. But, I, I, well, yeah, but we're, t we're uh, from a risk management perspective, we're tending to look at it as something that we need to treat as if it's a customer. See. I mean, I, I guess the, the way we approach this, this that fellow was talking about aggregated data that isn't uh, individually identifiable. So you, as, as an anonymous user, or people are upset about the having just the data aggregated. Period. So we don't. We again. I'm speaking for what what I've done on this. I mean, we we take a risk averse approach on all of these kinds of things to the degree that we maintain some kind of positive control over it. So where we feel that in any way some strange usage of information would violate either regulatory guidance or uh, our perception of what our customers expect based on the market research we've done, we stay away from it. Okay, But I'm sure that there are a lot of companies that would not have the same position on it. We, we discuss that a little later in the standpoint of where, what do you choose from a policy perspective Perspective, you know, obviously some companies are going to live on the edge. You know. Yeah, and talking as, as a consultant, I, th I think this is, I never consulted to Nationwide, but I, I did consult to a bunch of banks, right, when they were trying to establish their privacy policies, and the first thing we tried to understand was how many people in the company touched a particular piece of data, and they couldn't tell us. They didn't know the flow through the company from a piece of data about an individual, um, because the companies were so large. And um, the question of if the direct marketing group buys a, buys a, a list that has one of the customers on it, I think that's going to be extremely hard to, to legislate because to, for that for that direct com marketing company then to say, okay, let me make sure nobody on this list happens to me. Somebody could come along that's that's part of a bank and buy the list of the people who attended Black Hat, right, and mail to us. I mean, that's pretty common. You go to one of these shows. I don't know what Black Hat's policy is, but you know, I know RSA definitely resells their their list. And uh, is it going to be the the company, the 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 bank? Do they have to say, well, I can't ever, you know, mail to somebody on on this list that I got in a, in a unique way? Yes. I can't I can't remember the names of them, but if you if you give me your card, I'll send you a, a list and a presentation I have on it. So, oh, okay. More questions. Okay, we Okay, we also have a good list at the end, I guess, of the, the next presentation, the next after the break, of uh, good places to go for information about privacy and, privacy and things like that. Okay. So, the regulations themselves, and I'm going to hold the questions again, that's okay. Um, the regulations themselves, uh, d do you need to plan for privacy? Yeah, yeah, you do, you need, and you need a plan. Um, and again, no silver bullet, and I advocate a framework, maybe because yeah, I'm a consultant, but I advocate a framework. Eddie's got a slightly different view. You know, we're going to explain to you about how you can actually take this from the, from, from the stuff we're going to present right now, which is all the techie stuff about what the regulations actually say try to, to interpret them for you um, and uh, bring those down into something that you can actually implement. 
Uh, the way to do that, I think, is to really start with a matrix. Uh, you've got a lot of regulations. We talked about, what, 400 different pending privacy regulations right now. There are a lot of constraints. You're going to have federal, state, foreign regulations are going to be there. So it, consumer needs and some consumer wants, you got to start marking this out in a framework and get in, in a matrix and getting an idea of, of um, what applies and how. And we've done some tiny little matrices in here for you to take a look at. Um, what is a regulatory requirement? I don't know if anybody knows. I, I, you know, when I first started thinking about this stuff years ago, I, I didn't quite, I wasn't clear on it. Um, it's when a government, a state, or the um, state or federal enacts a set of constraints on an industry. So basically, they're saying you can or you can't do this. That's what's happening. Um, privacy re legislation is not new. Just as privacy invasion is not new, privacy legislation is not new. There was a Privacy Act back in 1974. Um, Fair Credit Reporting. Act, which people may know, that's when when people take a look at your credit. You ever been? You know, ever, have you ever? Has anybody here ever seen their own credit report? Yeah, was it okay? That's good. Uh, how many people here? Same same group of people that raised your hands before. How many people here was it? Was it accurate? Yeah, we, <laughs> that percentage went way down um, because they, they, it, it, your credit reporting tends to be pretty inaccurate. So that, that was, that was a, uh, brought into case so people could go against and say, hey, you know, this isn't right about me. Because um, this information is used to get you other loans, other credit uh, mortgages, things like that. So it's important. Um, there's was law and access to video rental. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but there, there, there was actually a, a case where a, 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 a state, a government worker's uh, video rental history was was brought out and uh, displayed to people, and he had rented a bunch of porno films, and that was actually against his platform, and it was not a good thing. So after that, there was a law on access to video rental, which was uh, enacted, and there's also the FDIC's FIL, which um, bases its privacy around uh, websites. There's also a lot of case law supported by Clarence Thomas on that issue. Yeah, I know. See, that's, I was going to bring up the Thomas thing. Yeah, that's because we couldn't get Thomas's video rentals. Yeah. Okay. Um, would have been interesting, though, during the, the hearing. Uh, it's, not, it's not just the United States. It is the, 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 the big guys, EU data directive. Uh, it, it went into effect October 25th, 1998. And uh, there's a lot of stuff around the data directive. I tried to give everybody just a tiny little bit of information around it so that you can get a sense of, of what it is. But it, it's basically protecting privacy. It is being legislated, and they are um, actually um, taking people to court for failure to implement it. And uh, actually, Sweden took. Um, Ugh, I can't remember which airline to, to court for it because the airline did, had not erased the personal data within 24 hours of a flight and that's seen as, as a violation of the data directive. So they're, they're actually out there, they've impl they're implementing and they're enforcing. Um, if you do business with a company in the EU, your company, if you have data and you're doing business with, with if you either have data about a European national or you're doing business in that country, you need to adhere to the data directive. Citibank actually put up a different processing pr center in North Dakota so that they could process credit card transactions because the, the processing was so different for, for the European versus the, the American. And, and uh, they actually have German auditors that come over from Europe to audit that, uh, that data center against these uh, European pr data protection directives. And you don't want to mess with a German auditor. Oh yeah, and, and of course, blame Canada, but Canada's going to jump on the bandwagon too. So, um, and yes. Oh, thank you. Yes, I, I, yes. We are. This slide has been updated. The, the legislation has been passed in Canada as of. Early February. Thank you. Uh, 
what you want to feel safe. Yeah, about. it was a it was a drag. You can imagine for the negotiators that they work out this deal, and then it goes to the parliament and uh, it blows up basically. Um, some of the articles I read on that said that uh, some people obviously weren't concerned about their political futures. That that basically decided that this long this deal that had been in the works for a couple of years blew up. Um, I'm not really sure where that's going to go. We have used the safe harbor principles as sort of a, a again a set of guiding principles in how we do business overseas. Um, I will tell you that the the philosophy that we're using is that the bar we need to set is the European uh, Data Privacy Directive. And because uh, we do business in Canada, you know, we do business all over Europe, and uh, it kind of constrains, it, just imagine, like, let's say you, uh, you have a, a business in Poland, you know, which is a difficult environment in which to do IT today. And, uh, you know, you want to have some redundancy somewhere uh, for that business in terms of, you know, the, the uh, infrastructure and so on. Uh, it, it's logical for us to bring it back to the U.S. if we can. In order to do that, we need to meet all of the European regulations. Once you get into that game and you look across your, you know, your various business units, you suddenly realize that you just have to play at that level. But, you know, ultimately, safe harbor would be a good thing uh, if it comes to pass, because it would at least give uh, U.S. companies a, a, you know, a model set of practices and procedures that they can follow that the Europeans would find acceptable. But for now, what you are relegated to do is follow the, the general guidelines of the data uh, privacy directive, and then in individual companies deal with the specific issues associated with registering your company with the local data privacy registrar. So it, it's complicated. It's a patchwork still. Um, HIP and healthcare speak. Oh, I'm sorry. You have a question? You've spoken so far about the liability of a company to its end users. What I haven't heard is how that is into being aimed for an ASP if it's properly used. Is, is that likely to transfer from the ASP? Or, or is there any liability to the ASP would have to the company that transfers it? Question. Yeah, that is a good question, and I don't know if you you were in the talk earlier, right, on ASPs. Yeah, there's a lot of the liability stuff. Going, and again, we are not lawyers. I mean, there's no. There's the not liability is going to be yeah. very, very, very interesting to watch how that that plays out. But there's there there are not a lot of, of examples out there in cases that people have seen. You it. know, the U.S. model for this kind of stuff is not trying not to do a whole lot of regulation and letting the courts sort, sort it out. And in my opinion, there is not sufficient case law in a lot of these issues that will come up, especially when they're applied against the new regulatory environment. Uh, but I mean, you can expect that most of the regulation pretty much gives consumers, individuals, the right to sue companies. And you can imagine both individual and class action lawsuits occurring. Time will tell where, where this lands us, you know. The, the companies today that are resisting regulation may in fact support it better when they see a lot of case law that's against uh, you know, their organizations. I guess my concern is not so much from the point of view of how, how do you treat the data, how do you store the data. That, that's the case that everyone who's complied with the, the most stringent inputs of the regular web. I think we'll organize the lock-in, lock-out means where one has got to leave it, to my mind, to the, the parent company who's ultimately clear with the relationships and how they use data. Yeah. If you're operating on it. Yeah, forcing compliance and, under, and and being able to enforce compliance is going to be very hard. And then linking liability if there's there's a failure of compliance, it's not. It's just not going to be. It's not going to be easy. Um, okay. Uh, HIPAA and healthcare. HIPAA is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, and Clinton signed it August 21st, 1966. There was a deadline in there that said that, uh, that it had to be enacted for privacy legisla legislation on August 21st, 1999. Missed the deadline. So the Department of Health and Human Services stepped in and said, okay, we'll, we'll do a federal privacy standard. And they did complete one on November 3rd, 1999. And that's posted, that's known as the NPRM. Anything, anytime you, you post something like this, it's the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, NPRM. That's how, the, that's how this stuff goes through, goes through the government. 
people were allowed to, you can post public comments, because this is a democracy, you can post public comments on any NPRM that is available, not just HIPAA, and not just the privacy legislation in HIPAA. HIPAA has a lot of, of moving parts to it. It's not just about privacy, and in fact, there's legislation on privacy and on security in there, so it's, it's, a, it's a pretty complicated, yes, did you have something immediate? Oh, HIPAA is, is an act that has to do with a variety of different things. One portion of the, the, the Administrative Simplification Act part of HIPAA is where the privacy comes in. So privacy in HIPAA is just a tiny part of the overall act. And the privacy and security regulations are just a tiny, a tiny piece of it. For the privacy standards. Well, it, it, yeah, that's... It. Well, the, the issue is that HHS released these draft regulations in November. There was a comment period. They got so many comments, which you'll see in a second, that basically they've gone back and, and are trying to figure out how to reconcile all these comments into some kind of, um, you know, actual final rule, as it's called. But no, no, there is no final ruling. I mean, there are, there are, there's prior stuff. You know, like th th those uh, regulations are associated with accreditation of health organizations have certain requirements regarding confidentiality of patient records, but it's not as comprehensive as the HIPAA stuff. And this is federal again. Your state, you know, your, your mileage may vary. Your state may be different because states do have their own state regulations. So this is just the federal. Um, and again, this is privacy and security. HIPAA is big. Um, but yeah, you can read the public comments. I advise you to read them. There are a lot of them. They're not all quite as entertaining. Many of them are as syntactically challenged, though, as, as this one is. And I've got the URL up there where you can go and, and read the public comments if you're, and you probably already read that. So anyway. Yeah, but I have a question about that. HIPAA is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. There is a, pri a, a portion of HIPAA. So it, it dealt with a lot of what HIPAA was, was around when Clinton brought it in as an act is, is about um, being able to protect people's ability to have health insurance as and with when they leave companies. And also for people's insurance information to not be splattered all over the world when and if they leave companies. So if I am at one company and I have, I am being treated for um, you know, d depression, then I'm sh depression's going or, or AIDS. You know, I'm being treated for something that's sensitive, and I go to a new company. How many people are going to see that information? As also my, but my medical care is still protected as I go from one company to another, and that's what it, that's why it's portability. And it, people often think the P in HIPAA is privacy. It's portability. Oh, they were ju just objecting to the regulation in general. It looks like, I mean, there are people who believe that, you know, especially constitutional law people believe that everything we need is already there. You know, we don't need anything to bolster the, f the First Amendment, you know, in terms of uh, right, free speech. Right. We don't need, you know, an anything to bolster the Fourth Amendment, you know. I mean, uh, and, and certainly there are a lot of companies that take that to heart as well. You know, don't regulate us, we'll self-regulate. Yeah, yeah, and I just put that comment up as an example of some of the interesting comments you can see, but yeah. Um, so yeah, to answer your question, the, the final rules are in flux. It's very hard if you're a healthcare company, it's very hard if you're an insurance company, I'm sure. I, I don't envy your job, Eddie, because uh, they, they are in flux, it's very hard to, to We don't get know compliance. where the bar's going to be, so we're just setting yeah. it really high and hoping for the best. Um, Uh, I, right. I this, this woman is saying that, that, that she's understanding that the, the, the final, the, the proposed rule is, is the right bar, and so you're, you're, you're working to that, right? Okay. Yeah, I mean, well, I can tell you that as, as a common sense person, that makes a lot of sense to me, but I will tell you that we've got a lot of pe business people in the organization that are hoping that based on a lot of comments that they've read, that that bar gets lowered, too. So, it, you see what I'm saying? I mean, it makes a lot of sense to, to think that way, and that's how I think, but we've got business people on the other side that have developed a business model that they can 
you know, go go a long way with if that bar is lowered a little bit from where it is. So, yeah, it, it is. It's, um, there, there's a security piece attached to HIPAA um, that can't actually go for final ruling until after the privacy piece. So folks are waiting for that as the second portion coming along. And again, um, there's there's some wait and delay. I actually heard somebody say that he thought that HIPAA was going to get thrown out completely, ultimately because of all of these delays. Although I don't think that's going to happen. That's not. I'm not going to take that bet. Yes, they do. They do. And there, there are some reference sites either at the end of my slide set or the next, uh, the next slide set will do. And, and I think it's in the book, your book too. You can go to, if you've got the handouts, there are listings in there. Um, I'm going to sort of scoot along over the, yeah, I, I go into depth here about what is covered. If you want to get a little bit deeper into to what the rules do, what's covered, to explain to people, you know, when the, when the, what HIPAA actually applies to it's when the information becomes electronic, but it protects the, I like this term, the paper progeny. So if you print it out, it's still protected. Um, and and uh, there are different rights and policies associated with it that you guys can read along. Um, based on those two, I came out with this. This is actually the important slide here. Here's an example, and this is a very little requirements matrix. This is just the beginning of what you're going to need to do as you start to Im um, impose these in your company with the policy elements. But go going through and saying, okay, what were requirements in HIPAA? Well, patient access rights, is that part of security and privacy? Right now it is. Um, confidentiality policies is part of both of them. And then privacy itself does require things like a privacy offer, officer, patient access to logs, and health information use and disclosure. So as you start to, to go through the policies themselves, sort out what the, the different elements are that you will have to adhere to, and then begin to see where they fall under which parts of the, the requirements. Okay, do you want to talk about FS or you want me to? No, that's fine. Okay. Uh I've just been yapping for a while. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, GLB, as it's uh, lovingly known in, in our organization, uh, last year signed. We thought we were going to have to implement it by November 13th of this year. They've given a reprieve to financial institutions, and uh, I think we have till July something of next year. But we're actually going to meet the November deadline just because we started down that path, and there it is. Um, yeah, financial services was a lot more efficient. I don't know if they learned from what happened in healthcare. But yeah, it's, well, it's once moved you, once on you get more people quickly. excited about it too, you know, you want to keep that momentum going. I mean, uh, just just to mail out the privacy notices is, is going to cost us two million dollars. Just to give you an example. <laughs> so um, anyway, uh, yeah. oh, and, and Graham Leach again is is another. It's it's a big act. It has a, it's very far reaching, and it's Title Five of that act, which deals with privacy. It is not just a privacy act. Right. There, there are sections that deal with privacy. There are sections that uh, deal with the security aspects. Um, just looking at what, what we need to cover since we're at it. Okay, the main requirements here is the same stuff we've been talking about all along. You need to have accurate uh, and, and conspicuous privacy statements. You need to provide a notice to the customers annually of what your privacy um, policy is or, or, and so on. You need to provide them the ability to opt out of any sharing of their data. Of course, there are loopholes through opt out because there are ways that we need to use information that are exempt from the opt out requirement. You know, For example, it's hard to issue a, a, a certain kind of account if you don't have a social security number, for example. Yeah, I mean, the bottom line with GLBA is that you have, to, you have to notify your customer when they come to you what your policies are. You have to update them about once a year, and um, it has to be written clearly. And you cannot share their information with third party, non-affiliated members, and they have the ability to opt out of your sharing policies. Uh, so there's a section of the GLB 501B that basically addresses some of the security related requirements and basically you're talking there about a standard of due care. Uh, the um, Fed and the FDIC, OCC, OTS, all those uh, regulatory agencies released a paper for comment recently that contains an actual description of the desired uh, security mechanisms, the policy, and you know what actually security is going to look like. We'll talk about that a little more in the second half of the presentation. But if any of you are involved with insurance companies, financial services organizations, you need to look at that because that's the bar to which you're going to be held accountable theoretically. If if 
those draft rules actually make it into some kind of final rule. We have, to, we have to time best. Yeah, and, and the, that stuff is available. That is on, on your links at, at the end there. They're, 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 they're very long. They're very dry. Some of these documents are you know, hundreds of pages long, but they're, they're certainly worth it if you're in the, the field and you, you're going to need to apply these. This is just a cheat sheet. Um, anyway, so again, you know, here's, here's again breaking out policy elements that, that are part of GLBA and their privacy. So impacts. This is this is Eddie's quote. He likes this quote. Um, impacts. What's gonna What's gonna happen? What if you don't do it? In other words, you know, you're gonna you're gonna get sent to your room without dessert. What's gonna happen? Um, Monica Lewinsky is a case study in, in invasion of privacy in a lot of ways if you look at it. There's actually a book, uh, I think it's a Sykes book, The End of Privacy, that actually it started to write it based on the uh, on Monica Lewinsky's story and turned it into a, 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 a privacy paper as, as it started to think about it a bit more. Which, that was a nasty case because you know, they went into her hard drive. And undeleted files. I don't know if you guys know that, but they, they actually part of the what part of what they got was they, they undeleted files that she had deleted on her hard drive that were personal private files. And that um you know, writing little journal entries basically about what she thought about the president. And they went in, got her hard drive and, and under, she didn't know about PGP and wipe, I guess. Um, well, I mean if you think of the origins of you know I mean the watershed in terms of privacy doctrine is uh, you know, the Brandeis uh, right to be let alone. Uh, and basically the reason that he got involved in the whole privacy concept, I mean this was I think in 1890 something, was because in a newspaper somebody had written a, a story with details of like his, uh, some party that his daughter had or something like that. And he just objected to personal information about his daughter and some party she had being published in all the, the newspapers. And so he became a privacy advocate and actually sort of started some of the key thinking on this whole privacy issue. Monica's <laughs> sort of in the same boat. So. <laughs> So yes, there is. We've already covered that. There's going to be some regulatory impact. There are some fines applied to those. I, we didn't mention them, but there's some very high fines uh, that are going to be associated with not uh, keeping within the, the regulatory and legal um, for, enforcements. Um, but there's other impact too that you should think about if you're not going to be a good privacy citizen at your company. Um, you're, as, as Eddie said when he went into to Nationwide, your brand name is on the line and you don't want to lose that. Um, there are financial impacts just around if your company is misusing the data or um, not adhering to privacy. And also there are some uh, some failure consequences that will, we'll, oh, I see. We're going to talk about these in more depth. Yeah. Well, we still have a little bit. Okay. Yeah, we have until 10 past. Question. Oh, you want questions? Well, I um, should we open this for questions for the next five five minutes before the end of the, or do you want to hear um, us talk about the impacts in detail? Don't all shout at once. Um, are there questions? We talked about this. Uh, yes. Oh wait, oh, hold on a sec. Before you guys leave, this is only the first half of this talk, so if you're brave-hearted, come back at 4.30. We're going to be talking for another hour about privacy, but we're going to be talking about actually implementing and how you get the framework and the technology side. The real stuff. The real stuff. Yeah, like uh, mergers and acquisitions, for example, uh, you know, we have a template that we use for security due diligence, whether we do it ourselves or we do it with, um, you know, some audit firm or something like that. We are building right now a privacy template, uh, and you know, it, it obviously, it just mirrors our our regulatory stance, mirrors our company stance, and then we do some due diligence. See. Right, but keep in mind if you get bought by somebody, <laughs> you may not be calling the shots either. You know, I mean, we, we acquire some companies and we have direct control over what happens in the next steps after we buy them. But frankly, you know, we buy some companies that we're told, this company, leave them alone because they're doing fine the way they are. And Sure. I mean, 
we'd be subject to obviously a lot of due diligence and consideration. Uh, some of it is cut and dried. I think some of it's going to have to be, again, risk management positions. And, and, and sometimes the government gets involved. I mean, they certainly did when travelers and city wanted to go together. I mean, that was the government crawled through their books and, and really told them, this is how this is going to happen. And it's not going to happen any other way. Any other questions? Yep. Yes. I mean, you're gonna, let's put it this way, there's gonna be some consumer backlash, right? But you know, a lot, again, a lot of this stuff exists in gray areas from a regulatory perspective. And uh, you know, luckily, I mean, you've got Robert Potofsky of the FTC, who is a real privacy advocate. And he, you know, tends to go after companies. But you know, right now, I mean, really, that's what you're talking about. If the FTC takes interest in it, Great, but if it doesn't fall within any of the regulatory frameworks that we talked about earlier, you know, you're SOL, I mean, in some cases, and you just got to live with it. Yeah, in some cases, it does go back to McNeely's quote of, you know, you have zero privacy, so it is a risk. Uh, a It is, the, it is the information gravy train. Your information, they're not selling all your data. I mean, they're, they're, they're not selling, <laughs> probably not, your, your, your actual buying habits. But they're selling your name and your address, yeah. Yes, and, and most, most credit card companies do that. And there are a lot of loopholes under FCRA, the you know, Fair Credit Reporting Act, that actually governs some of what happens with respect to privacy in that space. There are a lot of loopholes. I mean, I don't know how many dollars of credit you all get offered every week. But you know, I, I think one week I was up to three hundred eighty thousand dollars of credit that I was offered. You know, in between home equity loans and everything else. What amazed me about some of the offers is they very accurately knew how much I owed, and the, the loan value was really close to everything I owed that month. If you know what I mean, in terms of total. Three hundred eighty value. Uh, that <laughs> If it were that one and I could sign it and go off somewhere, I might do it. But I mean, you know, where, how do they get that info? Well, it's a, it's a loophole in FCRA. I mean, that's, that's how they can do it. Just like, you know, I don't know if you ever tried this, but you can obtain credit reports on other people if you, if you want to. <laughs> it's entertaining. So um, yes, we'll, we'll be here to answer questions and we'll be back at 4.30. So we hope you'll come back. We'll be talking about technology. Thank you. Thank you.